Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our session today. My name is Kathleen Walker, and I'm presenting uh, along with David Pearl for Communicate Health. Um, we are an independent research and consulting company focused on developing plain language health communication um, and creating health information that is easy for everyone to read and understand. Um, and today we're going to be talking about best practices in image-based health communication. I'm a senior health writer here at Communicate Health, and uh, my job is to write content at a plain language level that's easy for all users to access um, and make sure that we're following health literacy best practices in all of our creative materials. Um, and David, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is David Pearl. Um, and I'm a UX designer here at Communicate Health. So I typically work on uh, designing and uh, research and figuring out how to make the products that we create as, as easy to use as possible for everybody to understand and access. Great. So moving along to our next slide here, um, we'll start with an easy question. What is a pictogram? So today we're going to be talking about um, image-based health communication and pictograms are a core component of that. Um, a pictogram is a drawing or image that conveys information to indicate an object or express an idea. So it seems pretty simple, right? Um, here are a few examples of pictograms. One is a, a restroom sign. Uh, we always see the, the kind of stick figures there along with a brief text explanation of, of what it's depicting. Um, a similar sign here for arrivals at the airport. Uh, we have an, an image along with a word to show what it's depicting. And then um, this rest area sign is one that you might see on the highway. It's a little bit more complex um, and it includes multiple pictograms to indicate um, what people are able to do at a rest area. So, you might be wondering, I see a lot of icons on these signs. What is actually the difference between a pictogram and an icon? So uh, pictograms are a little bit more complex than they might initially appear. Um, icons may be literal or abstract, but pictograms have to be a literal representation. So when you're thinking about designing a pictogram, uh, you might be tempted to include elements that are not actually a, a literal representation of an object, but it's really important to keep pictograms as concrete and literal as possible um, and make sure that your pictogram conveys a complete idea with no additional explanation needed. So just as with the, the restroom sign and the arrival sign at the airport, um, it's able to convey the meaning that people need to understand with just the picture and that one word. So you don't need any other text explanation uh, to be able to get the idea of what you need to do from that sign. And on this slide, uh, we have some examples of pictograms in action uh, in health communication. Uh, pictograms have a, a lot of different applications. So uh, to show how to complete a process such as washing your hands, uh, to show symptoms like fever, body ache. Uh, this has been especially useful for COVID-19 symptoms um, to give instructions on what to do and uh, social distancing, especially in the, in the time of COVID-19, pictograms can be used to, to reinforce health best practices like that. Um, so I'll pass it over to you, David, to uh, quickly go through our pictogram best practices. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. Um, so today, I think the the majority of what we're going to be doing is talking to you about uh, the pictogram best practices that we we came up with um, as we evaluated um, hundreds and hundreds of different uh, pictograms, um, as you saw, kind of for COVID and for different other health best practices um, or, or health related content. Um, so our first one is to reduce cognitive load, um, which basically is just how much information uh, a person can process at a given time. Uh, the second is to use literal representation and avoid abstract symbolism. Um, and we'll, we'll get into all of these and break them down, but essentially this one is uh, not, not assuming that everybody knows what a specific icon means. Um, and, and if you are using specific icons, utilizing text and utilizing things that, that aren't incredibly 
abstract like this this square means a door without like the little details it might be hard to assume that somebody would just understand how, how you are thinking about that um, and that kind of ties with number three incorporating realistic detail that aids in understanding um, and then finally four is to tailor to your audience so just making sure that you know what they're comfortable with and um, kind of the culture and surroundings that help them make decisions. Um, those, if you can incorporate into your pictograms, always help. So moving into our first best practice here, um, number one, reduce cognitive load. So basically, basically cognitive load is the amount of information or the complexity of cognitive tasks that you're asking people to do when they're interacting with your materials. So for example, I, I think we've all gone to a website or opened a brochure and seen that there's just a ton of information. Um, there's a lot of things competing for our attention and we don't know what to do first. And that's an example of high cognitive load. So when you're creating image-based communication and especially pictograms, it's really important to take steps to reduce cognitive load as much as we can um, to keep things simple and really keep people's attention focused on the image. Um, and one way to do that is to use a consistent visual style in our pictograms. So in this example here, uh, you can see in, in the top example, we have this pictogram about just healthy behaviors. Um, and we have kind of three different image styles. So we have the, the fruit and the vegetable here, a clock for getting eight hours of sleep, and then our doodle getting active. Um, but having three different image styles can be distracting for folks and, and can contribute to higher cognitive load. So typically we would recommend using a consistent style of images. Um, and using the same character throughout your illustration. So here we have the same messages, but we have this consistent character demonstrating all of these points. Yep, um, so here's just another example, kind of on the left we see utilizing pretty similar styles. So yeah, on the bottom, um, the yellow option, we have uh, the person who's pretty consistently, you know it's the same person um, going through and showing all of the different symptoms that they may be experiencing, but the focus really isn't on, you know, who this person is or changing up the people. It is on what the symptom is. Um, additionally, um, in the upper left, you see that they do have the similar visual styles of this rounded um, design. So it doesn't look as abruptly different and it looks cohesive. Um, and on the right, we do have, you know, different visual styles. We have um, a silhouette one. Um, it looks like they're just kind of bouncing from different uh, illustrators from maybe a clip art or something like that. Um, but that lack of uh, cohesiveness kind of makes it so you're kind of unsure what you're sp supposed to be focusing on. Uh, so by keeping that consistent style, that focus, becomes more apparent and is brought out. Yeah, I think especially when we're designing materials quickly, it can be tempting to just grab whatever existing images are out there, right? But sometimes that can actually create confusion when we have very different visual styles. So I think this is a good example of keeping things consistent. And as we pointed out in the first example we looked at, um, if you use a character, it's important to use the same character throughout. So um, in this example here, these are actually some icons that the Communicate Health team designed uh, for Sarah Alert, which is a tool that allows people to report uh, COVID-19 symptoms basically to their local health department and allows health departments to more easily track COVID-19 cases in their area and keep up with contact tracing. So we designed these pictograms to illustrate uh, the different symptoms of COVID-19. And it was important to us to use a, a consistent character. Um, even her position is really as consistent as possible um, as we're showing the different symptoms there to really keep the focus on what she's feeling and the short description of the symptoms. Again, keeping those descriptions as simple as possible. Um, and here's another example that we found. Um, and as we see with this one, sometimes pictograms can be 
more literal than others. And we talked about uh, one of our other best practices is, is keeping things literal. Um, but as with this example, sometimes we, we might not want to show someone actually having diarrhea. It depends on the context of the material that we're putting together. So this one is a little bit more of a re literal representation than the icons that we came up with, but that context can vary depending on the audience and what you want to convey. Um, and then in this example here, we have a consistent character uh, demonstrating the steps of how to wear a mask. Again, she's looking straight ahead and the only changes in her motion is really to demonstrate how to put the mask on. And then in this example, um, we have a, a kind of inconsistent style. First, we have this image of the close-up of, of washing your hands. Um, and then we have these different characters who are demonstrating uh, different healthy behaviors here. So that's that could possibly be a little overwhelming for folks um, who aren't familiar with the content. So for this next one, breaking down complex action down into steps, uh, we definitely saw this so many times uh, over the last year with uh, COVID-19 and uh, the need to wash your hands properly. And thinking about how to wash your hands, there's multiple steps. Um, and I think one thing that we realized when going through this is when you take something that has so many steps and you try to put it into one pictogram, um, a lot of that communication gets lost. All those specific steps uh, can kind of be blended into one. If you just say, wash your hands, have somebody like this, uh, you're missing the whole action and the whole point of properly washing your hands. Um, so this recommendation to break down complex actions into steps helps uh, basically whoever is looking at it know which things they need to do in which order um, and make sure that you know there are those close-up hands so you can see exactly what they're supposed to do so they can copy it and it's clear. Um, and I think this also kind of ties with utilizing numbers. So there is a clear order of, this is the first thing you do, second thing you do, third thing you do, and then you're done. Um, and do you have anything else you'd like to add to this one, Kathleen? Yeah, I think that this is also a good example of, even though it's not using a character, all of these are using a consistent visual style um, to show the sequence of washing your hands. Um, They've kept the images simple. So really the focus is on the, the specific action that you're doing. I think that's especially important when you're dealing with a, a very kind of detailed sequence of events here, like washing your hands. And I, I just wanna add one more thing. I think it's kind of interesting um, when we looked at the pictograms that is a, like from a high level, we were trying to look at pictograms pretty universally. So we were picking pictograms from languages and countries that we don't necessarily speak the language or read the, the language. Um, but because they had this similar order of like following numbers or following a clear system, it is still pretty easy to understand what the information is, what, what that information being conveyed is. Um, so I think that was a, a piece of adding to this, like we, we don't understand and then, um, when we produce our pictograms, we wanna make sure that people who maybe not, who don't read English can still kind of get the general idea of what we are trying to convey. Um, so we're not only serving, you know, an English speaking audience, we're serving anybody who might see it and maybe uh, continue on there. Yeah, I think that's a great point to reinforce the, the main purpose of pictograms is to be able to convey the heart of your message through the image and then maybe have a, a brief text explanation, but you really want people to be able to get your main meaning through the image itself. And that's what makes pictograms such a great tool for communicating with uh, audiences that may not speak a common language or speak English as a second language. Um, and there's a lot of applications for that, which we'll get into later in our presentation. 
So this next step is about creating an obvious path for the eye to follow. So um, as with the hand washing example, uh, we have some pictograms here that are conveying a, a sequence of steps for the user to follow. Um, and it's important to make sure that the order of steps is visually clear. So in this first example, uh, we have a pictogram uh, that's demonstrating or a series of pictograms demonstrating how to take your TB medicine at the same time, following the same routine every day. Um, so here we have a sequence of events here, uh, very clear uh, laid out in vertical order with instructions next to each one. Then we have uh, this comic showing again, the sequence of washing your hands. This one is, is interesting because it's a little bit less detailed than the examples that we looked at on the previous page, but it is still using a consistent style um, and it's using the uh, convention of comic panels to clearly show the order of washing your hands um, and the panels are clearly labeled with numbers here in case people aren't familiar with the, the usual order of comics to expect. Um, and then this basic pictogram is just indicating to take your pill two hours before a meal. So super simple. Um, they're using the arrow here with two hours to symbolize take it two hours before meals. And then this example over here um, is a, a great example of how uh, maybe they were, were trying to create a more exciting design and, and the illustrations are definitely eye-catching, but the order is a little bit confusing. So um, here they're kind of going in a, maybe a clockwise direction, I'm not sure, but starting out with keeping six feet apart, washing your hands. Um, if you're sick, get tested and then stay home. But you're kind of asking the, the viewer to go back and forth to read these directions. Um, and I noticed that they're also using uh, numbers one through six here as if these are steps in order, but actually they're just uh, behaviors to, different behaviors you can do to help slow the spread of COVID-19 and stay safe. Um, so these don't actually need numbers because it's not really a sequence of events. Um, so I think that that's a good example of not creating a clear path for the eye to follow. Um, David, do you have anything to add about that one? Yeah, I mean, I think just a small thing then, and I will say this, we'll get into uh, design for your audience, but also thinking about if you're if you're creating something for a group that that uh, reads uh, left to no left to right, we typically read left to right. So if you're creating products for a group that reads right to left, that is the reading order that you're uh, trying to follow um, as well. So for Hebrew or Arabic or something like that, uh, we'd want to make sure that we follow the obvious path for the eye to follow for whoever that audience is. Um, because it does differ, but it is interesting that there that the, the the way of looking really is in an F pattern or a backwards F pattern, um, if that makes sense. So you're kind of looking from the top, going down, um, and and kind of glancing, or just going straight down, or the opposite way, but still the same versus kind of scattering it around, identifying where it could be. So. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. Um, so our, I think this, this may be our, our final tip on reducing cognitive load, um, avoiding icons that show more than one concept. So here we have um, a series of icons that are showing different emotions, um, and then a series of icons showing uh, steps to slow the spread of COVID-19. Um, and each of these is really focused on conveying one concept at a time, um, both all of them are using really clear, uh, very short descriptions. Uh, and then we have this, this final series of icons here. We have a person singing and a person sitting, um, all following sort of that same format of a one word description with these having a little bit more explanation there. And here we have an example of an icon that is, uh, it's, it's trying to tie all of these behaviors together into kind of a, a single Concept. So it's saying avoid contact with people who have a fever, cold, or influenza symptoms, which I can see how they wanted to combine that into one behavior. Um, but because you have multiple people here in this very small icon, they're, they're trying to show a person avoiding both of these people. Um, it's just a lot of information for the viewer to take in, especially in such a small 
space of an icon. Um, so we would usually recommend breaking that up into a series of icons there. Um, and here we have focus on what to do, but if you have to show what not to do, use symbols. So, um, so usually in health communication, we recommend focusing on what we want the viewer or the user to do, but there are times that you, you have to say what not to do. For example, uh, in this example here, we don't want people standing on the couch or we don't want people to hug. Um, sometimes you have to use a, a symbol such as an X or a line through it to demonstrate that. Here uh, we have an example that is trying to show uh, places to avoid, avoiding the three C's. Uh, the World Health Organization is trying to demonstrate how to avoid uh, spreading COVID-19. But here, even though they say avoid the three C's in the heading, uh, there's no symbol to indicate in the pictogram that these, these are things you want to avoid, right? Like in these examples, we have the, the X or the line through it, and they haven't used that convention here. So if someone were not able to read the headline there, they might not pick up on the meaning that these are things to avoid. Uh, David, anything to add on that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it is just thinking about when people see images, that's, that's typically what they look at first. So even if you have a great header, even if it is in the language you speak, you can still miss it. And because the information is just saying crowded places, close contact settings, uh, those uh, confined and enclosed spaces, it honestly reads right now as these are things that you should do. Like, mm -hmm. and you're actually doing the exact opposite of what your, your goal was. You're, you're pushing people towards these, these goals. Um, because just people look at the pictures first and that's just how your brain works. Yeah, I think even, even those of us that do uh, read the, the headline there, I think our brains are just naturally drawn to the image, like you said, David. And so it's easy for folks to overlook that. So our next tip, um, use literal representation and avoid abstract symbolism. So here's an example to start us off. Um, the message we want to convey is that seasonal allergies can cause sneezing. In this first example, we've used a, a tissue box, which is a pretty common symbol for allergies. We see it on commercials. I think people, a lot of folks might recognize that, but it's not universal. Um, so we can't rely on symbols to convey our meaning when we're trying to design a pictogram. Um, so here we have a literal representation of a person sneezing and holding the tissue to convey that seasonal allergies can cause sneezing. So this one's uh, very interesting, and I think it, you're, you're going to start seeing it everywhere now uh, once we talk about it. But it really is, if you're using characters, try to include facial expressions. Um, so on the left, you can see you don't need a lot of facial expressions. This person has their eyebrows, eyes, nose, and a mouth. But that still gives you enough information and gives your brain enough information to say, that's a face. And I know what a face kind of looks like. Um, you see kids drawing faces all the time, just two eyes and a mouth. That's, that's just enough information that helps you immediately know that you're looking at a person. Whereas on the right, we see, you know, what are they blowing their nose on? Is that, is that a person? It takes a minute to kind of identify what you're looking at. Whereas on the left, it's pretty instantaneous. Um, and I think, especially with these masks, um, showing proper mask usage, for example, you need a nose, you need a mouth. Um, and if you just kind of put like the mask on the face and there's no eyes, there's no context, it becomes really difficult to kind of figure out this is a person wearing a mask properly, I'm not sure. Um, so this kind of also connects to that reducing of cognitive load by giving enough details so you don't have to think about it. Yeah, so that's uh, sometimes I think we may think that we're simplifying images by not including facial features, but actually that can make it a little bit more confusing for the viewer. And here um, we have another good point to remember. Um, if you're using photos, choose photos that are relatable, authentic, and actionable. But 
not to the point that we're scaring people away from the topic that we want them to learn about. So for example, here we have a person uh, using an inhaler, we have a person washing their hands, and then we have people demonstrating these behaviors here. Um, in each of these, we're really focusing on the, the behavior specifically, um, not the surrounding environment. There's nothing distracting in the, in the background or anything else going on in these photos. Uh, so that's great. And then here we have an example that's, that's showing vaccination, but we have a, a needle going into someone's arm. And we know that some, some folks are, are a little wary of, of looking at needles um, and that might scare some people away if they have reservations about getting vaccinated or just a, a fear of needles in general. So in general, we would recommend uh, not using things that are showing uh, medical equipment as directly in that way, since that might scare some folks off. And I think in the event that we do have to kind of showcase those medical equipment in photos, using it realistically. So mm -hmm. this this is an absurdly large right. uh, needle. There, there's not <laughs> needles don't look like this, but um, <laughs> I, I think that that's kind of like that dramatization that maybe stock images might have that mm -hmm. we'd kind of want to avoid. Uh, because it does scare people. And even if you say, get your shot, and then there's this picture, you're, you're doing the exact opposite by, by scaring people away. Right. Uh, so a picture can be very important. And on, also on the left, this inhaler, uh, instead of using, a, for example, a prop inhaler that might look slightly different than the inhaler that people use, finding somebody who uses the right type of equipment and, and taking that picture so it's recognizable. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So uh, number three, incorporating realistic details that aid understanding. That's a great, great segue from our point about the inhaler there. Um, so here we have an example uh, that's a little bit ambiguous um, where it, we have a person just kind of looking sad and the thermometer next to them to symbolize a fever. Um, and again, a lot of folks might know what the thermometer means, but we can't rely on that symbol to be, to carry the meaning universally, right? Um, so in this next example, we have the person uh, visibly sweating, they have red cheeks and the thermometer is in their mouth to show you may have a fever. So here, um, adding details to provide context. Um, so we talked about before, uh, not including too many, I guess, extraneous details or, or things in the background that might distract people from looking at the, what you want them to focus on. So for example, with washing your hands, we, we stayed very focused on the motion of the hands to convey that meaning. Um, but there are some times that you might need to provide a little bit more detail to provide context for what you want people to do. So in this first example, we have the person in bed um, and it shows you zoom out to see the house and it shows that they're staying at home when they're sick. Um, in this example, we're showing uh, people social distancing in a public transportation situation. And so uh, they've kind of provided the outline of the, the train or the bus to just really set the scene for where these people are, um, rather than just having them social distancing in space. And here's a similar example of kids social distancing in the hallway. So um, they've just included a, a little door in the background and an arrow between them to set the scene that they are social distancing in the hallway specifically. So our next one is to use uh, realistic color. And so on the left, you can see, you know, these look like real symptoms that people are having. Um, the vomit looks like vomit, the skin rash looks like skin rash, and the people look like people. Whereas on the right, you kind of see, you know, a, an artistic representation that it, it's kind of cool, but it, it doesn't match the colors that people are typically familiar with of, you know, what, what is this blue drink that maybe the, the person is holding or, or these green things. It, it distracts and it pulls away from maybe the, the overarching goal of conveying information. Um, so we just would recommend to utilize realistic color, again, just to make it easier, just to take away those five seconds that it might take to understand what's happening 
Um, that's just a hindrance that doesn't need to be there. And on this next slide, um, showing realistic details when you're showing specific objects. So um, we have here a, a few examples uh, with allergies here. We've included some, some small details on the food so that users can quickly tell uh, what type of food it is. Um, and then with the shower chair here, um, I think this is a good example of where small details might really help users to identify what that object is. So for example, if they didn't have kind of the the lines and the dots here on the shower chair and the shower there in the background, um, it would be easy to assume that this is just any old regular chair um, if we didn't have those identifying details. And then here we have uh, an example of a person using oxygen and using an inhaler. Um, they've added a little bit of color to the inhaler to differentiate it from the rest of the background. Um, and included some details there on the oxygen tank so that it's clear to folks who use those items. Um, it's more, it's easier for them to immediately visually identify what they are. So uh, this next one is limit numbers, uh, but when you have to use numbers, provide the number in context. So again, we've been seeing a lot of six feet and I think giving that six feet visual like a line or an arrow or something that shows what you're talking about and how it connects to that number is is a nice way to do it um, versus on the right we kind of do have this 30 but because it's not in a, a timer or it's not in it, it doesn't really give us the information of how that 30 connects to what you're what the hands are doing um, it's kind of just floating and separated. So putting it in context just helps uh, your user kind of understand where where they are. And I, I think it also ties again to that, um, maybe not speaking the, the language that the pictogram is made in. Um, so without those visual cues of saying, this is a time, or this is how many times you need to be repeating this, this I, I have trouble understanding, for example, what this 30 connects to because I don't know what, what the surrounding text means. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas seeing 105 in the thermometer, it is a little blurry right now, but the normal one, you can see it a bit better. Um, I'm able to kind of identify that quickly and say, oh, 105 is the thermometer and I can continue on. Um, yeah. So our, our next point here, um, our, our final best practice is tailoring to your audience. So um, this one is, is a little bit more of a general thing to consider no matter what the topic of your pictogram is. Um, it's important to consider uh, who is your priority audience who is going to be using your pictogram. Uh, we talked about how pictograms can be a great way to reach uh, audiences that may speak multiple languages or speak English as a second language. Um, so that's a great way to use them, but it's also important to choose images that represent your priority audience. So in this first example, uh, we have a Hawaii COVID-19 initiative. And so they've, they've used a Hawaiian patterned face mask and clothes um, to make images that, that are probably going to be familiar to the priority audience. They've also used a local language as well as English there. Um, and then in this next example, uh, we have an example of, of pictograms that looks like it, it's targeted to a, a Hasidic Jewish community here. Um, we have an image of a, a person wearing a hat and outfit that looks similar to the person depicted in the pictogram. So I think that's a good example of choosing images that, that represent the community that you are wanting to communicate with. Um, and then finally, this last example, uh, we created this pictogram and materials to promote uh, healthy behaviors around uh, TB medication adherence um, within the Haitian community. So we chose uh, a family here uh, wearing clothes that would, would resonate with that community uh, to make sure that those images match the priority audience. And here uh, we have enhancing and incorporating existing products for people with disabilities. So uh, there are a number of, of products out there that already use images to 
uh, help people with disabilities communicate more effectively and to communicate what to expect in certain situations, uh, such as augmentative and alternative communication. Um, and here we have kind of a communication board where people can use these images to communicate. Um, we have some examples here of how uh, these types of images can be used to convey ways to stay safe from COVID-19. Uh, David, did you have anything else to add on this one? Um, I, I think it's just interesting to see the best practices that uh, th this uh, communication board typically uses. And I think all of them pretty much focus on what we've already reiterated. Um, so this, this way of communication really, uh, I, I think it's, it, it is a great prime example of this communication. So I think I typically will look to board maker and those kinds of things when I'm not sure how best to communicate it because I think they've been doing it for so long. Um, and I think they just have great examples um, of, of taking something so specific and, and just conveying it in a way that seems uh, as, as minimal as possible, just so the focus is on the action. Yeah, I think that can definitely be a source of inspiration to draw from as we're designing pictograms. Um, and then as we said before, remembering to use the, the, audi the language that your audience uses um, as well as English. So here we have just examples of materials uh, that we found from, from different countries. Um, and here's a, a great example of choosing an image that represents your priority audience as well. Um, just showing how all these images have incorporated uh, the pictogram and English content as well as the priority audience language. And I think, oh, uh, just Go one, ahead. one thing. Um, and I think the, there is a big value in including English with the audience uh, language. I think, for example, a pamphlet or a poster, by having two languages, it not only allows people to um, read it and like kind of immediately understand it, but if, if it's like a handout that you, you give to somebody, they can utilize it as a way to bridge communication with somebody else who might be a translator in their family or might be uh, helping them make decisions, um, like a doctor or somebody. So. It, it allows this tool or this pictogram, whichever you created, to kind of extend past just who you're talking to and, and creates a shared language around what you're trying to say as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I think English can help to make materials uh, more universal in some contexts. And next we've included a couple of case studies to kind of bring these pictograms to life and show how we have used uh, image-based communication in some of our own projects that we've created here at Communicate Health. Um, so our first example is improving COVID-19 symptom pictograms uh, to help with comprehension for non-native English speakers. Um, and we talked a little bit about Sarah Alert in a previous example, but MITRE developed this Sarah Alert tool to support local jurisdiction contact tracing efforts during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but basically how it works is if you're sick or you spend time around someone who has COVID-19, your health department might call you and ask you to report your symptoms every day through Sarah Alert for a certain amount of time. Um, and there are different ways that you can report your symptoms, but the goal is to get people reporting their symptoms every day so that the health, can, health department can keep track of COVID-19 cases in the community and help people get the help they need. Um, so the CH team redesigned Sarah Alert's symptom reporting flow, which is the process that uh, consumers or people who have COVID-19 or have spent time with someone who have COVID-19 need to go through to report their symptoms. Um, so originally it was, Sarah Alert basically just had a, a list of COVID-19 symptoms 
um, which might be a little overwhelming to folks because as we know, there are a lot of symptoms associated with COVID-19. And so we kind of revised the, the pictogram, we revised the symptom descriptions to make sure that they follow plain language best practices, that it's very clear to people what each of these individual symptoms is. Um, and then we also designed pictograms for these symptoms to make them more accessible to a variety of audiences. Uh, we actually heard that that some groups were having trouble using Sarah Alert because people didn't speak English as a first language and, and they weren't sure what the symptoms meant. Um, and so having these pictograms helped to uh, cut down on translation efforts so that MITRE didn't have to translate the descriptions into as many languages and made the, uh, the symptom descriptions more accessible to a wide variety of audiences. So, and made it easier for all users to report their symptoms accurately. Um, and here are just a few examples of our pictograms here. So we wanted to test the pictograms um, to make sure that they were easy for everyone to read and understand. So to do that, uh, we recruited 35 participants who were native speakers of, of all of these languages. Um, the participants com completed an unmoderated Google survey in their native language. So basically, we asked people to take this survey that had these, uh, the direction to describe these pictograms in your own words. So we didn't really give people any context that these were COVID-19 symptoms or what it was all about. It's just kind of, here's the picture, how would you describe this? Um, and that way we were able to see if people were able to pick up on the meaning without any other context. So what we found was that all or almost all of the participants were able to interpret these pictograms correctly. So these are, are pretty concrete symptoms, I think. Um, chills, fatigue or feeling tired, uh, headache, nausea or vomiting, and sore throat. And for a couple of the symptoms like nausea and vomiting, we actually designed multiple different pictograms to test uh, which one resonated with people, which one people were able to identify more easily. Um, and this is the one that, that resonated. It was showing a more literal representation of vomiting. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit more detail on that in this next slide. So confusing pictograms, um, these were the ones that people struggled to identify a little bit more, uh, meaning that we got a, a wider variety of answers and not everyone got what the pictogram was supposed to represent. So with this first one, difficulty breathing, um, that is a, a symptom that's surprisingly hard to depict because what does breathing actually look like? That might look a little different for everyone. Um, so we had to play around with, with the position of that. Um, diarrhea, people didn't really get this image where the person was, was just thinking about the toilet. Uh, we had wanted to keep that one a little more discreet and not really show the person sitting on the toilet, but we found that people had a hard time uh, understanding the, the meaning of that without that context. Um, loss of taste was a hard one. We found that people didn't really get what the X over the mouth meant. Um, some people thought it meant don't eat this or this is hot or <laughs> people kind of interpreted uh, the wavy lines there differently. So that one was a little confusing. Uh, muscle pain was also confusing, and then used a fever reducer. We found that, that that one was a little bit more complex. Not everyone got that one at first. So uh, then we revised these based on our participants' feedback to make sure they were easy to understand. So uh, difficulty breathing, we changed the person's position a little bit um, so that they're kind of looking off to the side there, we got rid of that kind of puff of air since that was a little bit confusing for people. Uh, diarrhea, we ended up showing the person sitting on the toilet, which is a little bit more literal and that was easier for people to, to associate with diarrhea. Uh, the new loss of taste, we ended up changing the food to an apple to avoid kind of conflating hot soup versus I can't taste. <laughs> um, so we, we played around with a lot of different foods for that, but we found that an apple that's just room temperature was the most straightforward and we changed it from an X to a question mark. So the person is confused because they can't taste the food. Um, for muscle pain, we basically ended up turning the person around so that we can see their face uh, and change the location of some of the spots of pain on their body to more closely align with what people might experience. 
And then for using a fever reducer, uh, we actually changed it so that the person is both holding a, a bottle of medicine and a pill. And we also added this thermometer there, which is a little bit more abstract, but we felt that it was important for the person to be focusing on taking the medicine and to show the thermometer in the background with the down arrow to show that their temperature is going down. So I think that's a good example of how sometimes there can be a little bit of complexity in figuring out. We, we wanna keep these as literal as possible, but sometimes we do have to bring in a little bit of abstraction to convey a, a more complex idea. And uh, here's a quote from one of our research participants about the the new symptom reporting process with the pictograms, they said it's actually fun to fill it out. It's just more eye-catching. Uh, the version without the pictures felt like you're filling out a form in the doctor's office, which nobody wants to do that. And they said, do you really want to be filling out a boring old form every single day? So this person was more engaged with the version with the, with the pictograms included. Um, so I think that goes to show that even for people who who speak English and can read, you know, a long list of symptoms or read directions or whatever it might be, um, adding pictograms can help to, to keep people engaged and motor, motivated to interact with your content. So um, those are the changes we made to, to Sarah Alert to make the symptom reporting process a little easier for folks. Um, and then we have one other uh, case study example here and I'll turn it over to you, David. Hey, thanks. Um, so our second case study is just using pictograms to support medication labels and comprehension, uh, or medication labeling, comprehension, and actionability. Um, so uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so in 2019, uh, Communicate Health conducted research study for Novo Nordisk, a Danish pharmaceutical company. And um, Novo Nordisk wanted to understand preferences and understanding picture-based medication instructions. So, um, you know, the little, like on the box of a medication or on the like paper insert that comes with it, um, there sometimes are these instructions on how to use things and they wanted to see how uh, consumers were kind of understanding those uh, instructions. So these were the examples that they had. Um, and we, we went through and tested these with a, a variety of audiences. So our first one um, is this uh, pictogram and the text is keep pills in packaging until you're ready to take it. Uh, the second one is do not cut pills from packaging. And the third one is do not cut, crush or chew pill. Um, so these are just, the interpretations that they're, the, the goal is uh, of Novo Nordisk is so people see these images and kind of understand that. Um, but we took away the text and we tested them similarly how, to how we did it for the Sarah alert. Um, so this is our first icon um, about keeping the pills in the package until they're ready to take it. Uh, so we had many participants that said, this image is showing a cell phone or a TV remote. Um, and many participants, once we told them, hey, uh, this means keep pills in packaging until you're ready to take it, we're also wondering about why. Why is this important? What, is, what are the consequences of not doing it? So thinking about, um, first of all, understanding and putting something clearly out there of saying, keep it how it is, but also giving a little bit of context um, of a consequence or, or something like that. So it, it is clear and then the person is like, oh, okay, that's, that's what I need to do. Um, our second one, um, do not cut pills from the packaging. Um, so a few participants were able to get it, don't cut the pill, uh, or actually, no, a, a few participants thought it specifically meant not to cut your pill, like one pill individually, um, which, could make sense maybe because of the line of, of how it's being cut in the, in the graphic. Um, and then also, again, several participants shared reasons why people should not remove the pill from the packaging. Um, so maybe it's dangerous for the pill to touch metal or would contaminate the other pills. But without that context, there opens the door for assumptions of, of kind of 
you know, figuring out why you are asking me this. Um, so that was the interpretation for number two. And then our third one um, is do not cut, crush, or chew the pill. Um, so when shown the icon, most participants said, this means don't cut the pill. Very literally, do not cut it with a pair of scissors. Um, so crush, chew didn't kind of come through in the icon or in the pictogram, but, but cut definitely did. Um, so when shown the icon with the text, most participants said that these didn't really match and they should show crushing or chewing as part of that icon as well. Um, and then I think we did also see some participants think it was a grape for a second, just because that didn't really look like a pill for them. Um, so that's just something interesting as well of, of maybe, maybe the pill could look a bit more like, uh, like a capsule or a tablet or something. So it sounds like in this study, we found that even though these pictograms at first glance might appear to be pretty literal representations, uh, there was some information that they left out um, and people still had trouble understanding some of these. Um, and so I think doing this kind of audience research is really important when you're working with pictograms, uh, just to make sure that the meaning that you convey is actually coming through in your images. And I know we're, uh, we're getting close to time. I wanna make sure that we have a few minutes for questions, um, but just to wrap up uh, our key takeaways that we talked about today, we're using pictograms to show recommended behaviors, symptoms, and other health concepts. Uh, pictograms are a great way to reach users who speak English as a second language, um, have limited literacy skills, limited English proficiency, or cognitive disabilities. Um, and they can also help to reinforce key messages for everyone as we saw with the Sarah Alert pictograms, um, even people who can read a long list of symptoms might not want to. So including pictures helps to keep people engaged. And the four main takeaways to remember about designing pictograms were reducing our cognitive load, uh, keeping things simple so people know what to focus on, using literal representation and avoiding abstract symbols, um, incorporating realistic details that aid understanding, and then finally, tailoring to your audience's needs, both by including the audience's primary language in English and choosing images that represent your audience. So uh, we have a few minutes left and I will uh, see if we have any questions here in the chat. Yeah, um, I have the questions up so perfect. I can kind of read them aloud and um, yeah. So, uh, the first question is, what are your favorite resources for creating your own images? And I think I, I mentioned Boardmaker is a really great one to look at um, as just for inspiration. Um, but typically, I mean, we're, we, Communicate Health has a design team that we can look to to, to create these illustrations. Um, and I think there are a couple other resources. Uh, I, there's a, a European sponsored pictogram um, company, but I, I can't remember the name right now, but they also do a lot of uh, communication board icons and pictograms, um, which, which could be a good resource to look at. Um, so our second question is, can you share how you get user feedback on your icons and pictograms? Do you get input on what images, what the images mean to them? So I think our, our process for the Sarah Alert tool was actually a great example of this. So um, we initially designed pictograms for Sarah Alert just based on our knowledge of, of pictogram best practices and health literacy best practices. But then we created this survey to test the pictograms with users from uh, a variety of primary languages. Um, and as we mentioned, we didn't provide the users with context of what the pictograms were supposed to be about. Um, the way we structured it was just to include the pictures on a survey and give people an opportunity to label them. Um, and that's how we were able to identify which pictograms really resonated with people and which ones uh, we had a, a higher uh, amount of variability in people's responses. 
Um, so then from there, the, the pictograms that we saw uh, a lot of people struggled with or we got a lot of different answers for, we went back to the drawing board and considered how we could design those a little bit more clearly and, and make them as concrete and literal as possible so people could understand the meaning. So our next question is, I heard the emojis are the next universal language. Would you agree? Uh, I find that some emojis are confusing and also may not be interpreted the same way by all people. How do you determine what is universal? And I think this is a really interesting question. Um, there is no universal that's actually universal, um, which makes it really difficult sometimes. Uh, but I think that that's where tailoring to your audience really comes along. Um, and then thinking about who that audience is, who's who are the first groups of people that you want to imp be impacted by your pictograms? And then and prioritizing them will help you get the best pictogram for your time and effort. Um, as far as emojis go, I think it, they are moving towards kind of like being more universal as more people utilize their phones. Not everyone has phones. Um, if you have an Android, what you see is very different than if you have an iPhone. Um, but I think it is a kind of interesting place to look for ideas. Uh, it may, maybe not exactly this or this is what we should use. We should only use emojis because I, I, I don't think that's the absolute best way. But I think kind of using it and thinking about, okay, like hearts are pretty well understood or smiley faces are pretty well understood. Um, but maybe the, the very specific emojis might, might need some tweaking or might have been designed for an audience that's not uh, your target audience at that moment. So I think it's all about context, really. I mean, if you're, if you're making things for like teens who are always on their phone, who are very familiar with emojis, then I think that's, that's a place where emojis could shine. Um, so... Our next question is, is there a recommended number of concepts to limit a pictogram to before it's considered uh, cognitive overload? Um, I would say, I don't think there's a, a, a hard and fast rule of, of number of concepts, but I think you, what, what, a good way of like testing yourself is just having that image up um, and seeing, am I understanding all the information without the text there? Or am I getting like a gist of it? Um, and if, if you're kind of, maybe you have like a cough and a sneeze and, and like something else all in that one image, it may, you, you'll be able to kind of see, hey, maybe this is too much, or maybe I can figure out a way to focus on just like sick and then use the ability to be very specific in that text. Um, so I think just kind of self-moderating those, those pictograms could help. The last question, okay. Um, is, is there a repository, that one? Okay, is there a repository of images Gra pictures, graphics you would recommend for writers who do not have a designer on their team? I think, um, I'll have to look it up. It's the, it's the one that's sponsored by the European Union. So I can, I can share it with IHA and, and they can send it out. Um, I think that's a pretty good one. Um, as far as getting images, you could look to noun, the noun project. Um, it's, I think, the, noun, the nounproject.com. Uh, yeah, the nounproject.com, there's these free icons. Some of them are great. Some of them aren't great, um, but kind of using that as uh, a base um, so you don't have to create everything from scratch and you can download those as uh, PNGs so you can pretty easily uh, utilize them without having a designer or a designer software. Um, yeah, yeah I, I I'm not a designer myself and I've used the noun project when I just need to mock up something quickly and see how it'll look. So I think it's a great resource. OK, 
Okay, I'll jump back to question number, I think, five. Uh, we try to be very inclusive in our materials, showing uh, varying races, genders, and ages. If the overall design style is the same, is that consistent enough? I think that's a great question. Um, I, from a content perspective, I think what I would recommend is when you are showing just a, a series of behaviors, like for example, the steps in, in washing your hands or steps to stay safe from COVID-19, within that series of images itself, I would lean toward using the same character or the same person. Um, but then for different pictograms, maybe within the same material, you could use uh, characters of different races and backgrounds. David, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that that makes perfect sense. Um, okay, well, thank you everybody so much for letting us share. Um, and yeah, have fun at IHA. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.